Welcome back. Scientists with the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration say that greenhouse gas emissions between 2012 and 2014 were the highest ever recorded over three consecutive years. Meanwhile, the International Energy Agency reports that emissions stalled last year, remaining at the same level as 2013. Now, to help us sort out what all this means for global climate is Wang Tao. He's a resident scholar at the Carnegie Tsinghua Center for Global Policy in Beijing. Still with us here in Washington is Manish Bapna of the World Resources Institute. And joining us from Paris is Nick Nuttall. He's the head of communications and outreach for the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Thanks again to all of you for being with us. Nick, let me start with you. I just cited those figures from NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric uh, Administration here in the United States, and from the International Energy Agency, that from 2012 to 2014, emissions of greenhouse gases were at their highest level, but they leveled off last year. These are two agencies which appear to be giving us different figures. There seems to be some contradiction here. Can you help us with this? I don't think there actually is a contradiction, but this is, uh, seems on the surface to be quite complex. Uh, I think what, the, uh, what NASA and indeed the UN's World uh, Meteorological Organization was saying was that we have the concentrations of greenhouse gases, the concentrations of pollution in the atmosphere at record levels in March, because this pollution builds up, has been building up over many, many decades, indeed since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Now, when the International Energy Agency came out with their report on uh, the, last year, saying that, that last year the amount of emissions kind of stalled, what they're saying is the emissions that year actually stalled. So this is emissions from the burning of uh, coal and oil and gas, energy-related emissions. So while the concentrations have been building up over some time, the good news is that in a year where the economy actually grew worldwide by something like 3 percent, we didn't actually add any more into the atmosphere from the energy industry. Uh, and that may indicate that perhaps we are beginning to see uh, a light at the end of the tunnel in this story, that maybe we're starting to see the decoupling of economic growth from more pollution. So let's see what happens. One year is not a trend, but it could be the beginning of something good. Tao, what is the situ situation in China? Uh, China has experienced uh, an economic slowdown, relatively speaking. Has that contributed to lower greenhouse gas emissions? Yes, certainly. I think you are spot on. China's economy has been weakened since last year, and uh, the result the energy demand is also has been slowed down. And in some of the major, uh, uh, major um, energy fuels, for example, coal, actually we saw the absolute reductions for the first time in almost two or three decades. So that is quite a strong signal to the economies. Um, and also because of this, um, we are probably will be able to see the growth of China's energy dem demand may not be grow as quicker as as quick as we expected. So that slowdown of the economy and also the resulted potential structure change of Chinese economy may have a lot of impact on the future of energy demand and also the carbon emissions. Manish, let's go back to the situation in India, and I'm going to quote NOAA again, the Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. It says that it's going to be very difficult to reverse any increase in greenhouse gas concentrations even if there is the wholesale abandonment of fossil fuels. Do they have a point? Because in a country like India, you have growing urbanization. You've got an economy that's growing, more factories. So, so uh, the, we need to see a pretty radical drop in emissions over the next 30 or 40 years in order to try to stay within two degrees. It's not going to be easy, but it is still plausible. Uh, economically, you can make quite a bit of sense. Uh, we are seeing over the past six months and in the run-up to the International uh, Climate Convention that will be taking place in Paris, a number of commitments that different countries are making, the United States, China, and others, that are taking some bold commitments to try to reduce those emissions in order to avoid catastrophic climate change. In India, you do have this kind of moment where you have a demographic shift, a lot of young people that are coming into the workforce. You have an urbanization shift. You have a big investment in manufacturing. So there is going to be a need for much greater energy, much more energy. But some of that demand can be addressed through improvements in efficiency. And as we see clean energy, starting the cost of clean energy to come down dramatically, to become more competitive 
compared to fossil fuels. They avoid some of the problems of fossil fuels, such as air pollution or energy security concerns, that there is a way even for India, which will see a growth in its emissions, still dramatically be less than what otherwise would have been anticipated. Nick, I want to look at one other factor, and that is cheaper oil has been associated with increasing greenhouse gas levels. Uh, given that, can we see a rise in emissions then? Well, you know, it, we're living through an extraordinary time because you're right. In the past, when the oil price went down very, very low, it took away a lot of the incentives, in a sense, to invest in uh, renewable energy. But this time round, it's very different. Um, we've seen the oil price come down quite dramatically. It wasn't so long ago that it was something in the $40 a barrel area. And yet investments in renewables have continued uh, almost as if the oil price hadn't changed at all. And indeed, it's been a kind of shaking out of the oil industry that you've seen, because some of those leases that some of the oil companies have been taking out in, uh, in the Arctic for this deep drilling uh, didn't make any sense at uh, below $75 a barrel. The, the oil was simply too expensive. So we are living in a different moment in time where renewable energy now seems to have got to a point in many, many countries, including developing countries, where it's actually the best option you can take at this particular moment in time, uh, economically and then for the environmental benefits that come with it. Tower, China has relied on coal to generate electricity. Uh, China is expected to submit its climate uh, target to the United Nations by the end of this month. What can we expect? Yes, clean energy is definitely going to play a vital role in China's combat for the climate change. But also it holds a key for China's clean up of the air pollution. So if we look at the uh, targets Chinese government already announced that are very ambitious, they're looking for about 15% uh, of the non-fossil fuel energy in total energy demand by end of this decade and then by 2030 to reach 20 percent. So that means a lot of new uh, either wind or solar or hydro or other uh, cleaner energy will be get online in the next 15 years. And that is a huge commitment. And that is going to, um, if we can see that it will be delivered, then there will be a strong change for China's energy structure. Manish, uh, the International Energy Agency Director Fatih Beryl says well, these are his words, there needs to be a peaceful divorce between economic growth and the rise in greenhouse gas emissions. You've talked specifically about the situation in India. What would that look like? So, so I think we can see a lot of examples where, I mean, the, the conventional wisdom has been typically that growth results in greater emissions. And I think there's been a lot of evidence in real world examples over the past few years where that's a false choice, where you have to choose between growth or emissions. And just to give you two or three very simple examples that speak to India, um, degraded lands. India has a lot of degraded lands. Restoring that land both increases growth, improves the productivity of that land, and also sequesters carbon emissions, reduces emissions. Uh, cities. India is urbanizing very rapidly. Is it going to create cities that look more like Barcelona, which are compact and good quality of life, or are they going to create sprawling cities that are highly reliant on cars and have poor air pollution. If they choose the former, that is something that is both good for growth, good for quality of life, and also reduces emissions. Nick, global government scheduled to meet uh, in Paris in December to discuss a possible new agreement on climate change. Um, what can we expect out of that meeting, realistically? Well, we will get an agreement in Paris. Uh, and the question is how ambitious that agreement will be. But I think we're in a very different place to how we were in Copenhagen just six years ago. I think there the, the value proposition in Copenhagen was we had to sacrifice to, to save the world. Now the value proposition seems to be that the sacrifice will be if we don't act. Uh, and uh, there is so much of a groundswell of a momentum for change among the private sector, among financial sector, among cities, as was just mentioned by our colleague there in Washington, and among the governments themselves. I think, you know, countries now feel very much empowered by what's happening around them. I think they feel very empowered by, by not only the science, the ec but the economics. Today, uh, or this week, you know, we've had uh, the Pope in uh, the Vatican issue an encyclical about the moral imperative for acting on climate change. So all the elements are coming together. So there will be an agreement in Paris. It will not solve climate change overnight. It's absolutely clear whatever's on the table from the governments won't be enough to keep us under two degrees C. But what Paris must put in place 
is a long-term strategy, a long-term goal, a long-term destination about how governments will actually finance uh, the developing countries to meet their climate ambitions and also put in place the milestones that will actually lead to a climate neutral world at the end of this century. And, you know, this is very exciting. We're trying to restore the balance of planet Earth back to how it was before the Industrial Revolution, but in a 21st century setting. Tal, getting back to China's uh, reliance on coal-fired power stations, on the use of coal, the International Energy Agency is proposing that coal be phased out completely. Is that practical for a country like China? Uh, I think certainly that coal is still playing a very important role in China and will be uh, play a very important role in the near future. But I think there is already a lot of measures has been taken on uh, reducing the reliance and also the impact of coal. For example, the development of the renewables are developing very quickly. Um, China has already become the number one in terms of the clean energy investment for quite a few years in a row. And that will result into a large uh, scale of the investment in wind and also solar. For example, last year, China actually ending about 20, more than 20 gigawatts of wind. So there are also other measures, for example, cleaner coal burn, uh, burning technologies. Um, that will give China also the benefits of reducing the air pollution. That would be, I think, um, a more realistic uh, prospect of coal in, in, the, in the near term and long term, uh, and, sorry, and the middle term. But in the longer term, for sure, that we will have to translate to a um, much more cleaner energy structures, and there will be technologies and also costs will be have to be made uh, to make that transition. Well, that's where we have to leave it. Wang Tao in Beijing, Nick Nuttall in Paris, Manish Bhavna with me here in the studio in Washington. Thanks to all of you for joining us. That's it for this edition of The Heat. But the conversation continues online. Join us on CCTV America's Facebook page to comment on this or any other show, or chat with us on Twitter at CCTV underscore America. I'm Arnand Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for being with us.